Uh, I appreciate the elders for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, I was thinking and talking to someone. I had, have never done this at Loveland before. Um, so if it doesn't go well, I said the worst thing that happens, I'll just sit down and start crying. Uh, but it, it's been six years, six years since we left Loveland, uh, and it feels like yesterday. Uh, the only thing different is Kendrick now has a gray beard instead of a brown one. Uh, unfortunately, he's still bald, uh, but I am catching up to him, uh, catching up quickly, I think. Uh, but, but you guys are, are very much a family, uh, and it's, that's why I was just so excited to be here. And I understand exactly what Paul was talking about when he wrote in his letters to the Romans about how he was so excited that, uh, to go spend time with them, and he was disappointed that he hadn't been able to be there previously. Uh, just the love that he had for the Roman church, and I understand that because it's the same love that I have for the Loveland church. We were uh, actually in work, or in town, excuse me, for a work conference. Um, it starts this afternoon up in Estes Park, and it goes through this week, and so I decided to take a couple vacation days before it uh, and after it uh, to spend some time with some family and friends up here. When I was talking to someone uh, about coming to Colorado, I said that, yeah, we're going to spend some time with family and friends. They go, oh, you got family in Colorado? It's like, well, yeah, uh, the, the church family. And it, when I said church family, it was like, what, what are you talking about? That, that's not family. Uh, because people outside the church, they don't understand that the family that is the church. Uh, and that's what Loveland is to me. Because prior to coming to Loveland, uh, I, I, I was looking for something that wasn't there. Uh, my, my life had kind of fallen apart. Uh, I firmly believe now and understand that God is the glue that holds our life together. And what happens when we take glue out of something? It falls apart. And that's where I was, and that's where, where Loveland came in and helped me re realize that um, and, and, and get back to where I needed to be. Um, and I think the pivotal conversation uh, where I got smacked upside the head with a 2 by 4 came from Dortha McCollum, one of the sweetest ladies in the world, smacked me upside the head with a 2 by 4 uh, And ever since then, it really made me stop back and think, uh, and, and that just got me uh, where I needed to be. And it's undeniable the fact that Loveland is a family to us. The last time we were here was four years ago, uh, and Megan was pregnant with Coulter. Now he's a, a fiery little redhead that is off his sleep schedule and is ready to be taken outside once today, and uh, he's cruising for to be taken out back another time. Um, but it is undeniable that, that we love you, and I think it's undeniable that you guys love Megan and Coulter and you tolerate me. At least that's what my dad tells me, um, that, that they love Megan and Coulter and they tolerate me. But I am excited to be here this morning, excited to share a couple thoughts uh, from, from the Word. It's undeniable that we're all here together. It's undeniable that we're family. And I want to talk a little bit about this undeniable Jesus that, that we look at and that we know, that we understand. And also I want to express my appreciation to Michael for, for sharing his, his pulpit this morning uh, and letting me come in and, and talk uh, briefly. Before we get into our text, which is going to be John chapter 9, I want everyone to start off and think about baseball. Are you guys familiar with baseball? Go Rockies, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a purple and black team just a little bit south of here. Uh, but think about baseball. And there was a Yale uh, physicist who actually studied the pitchers. And the amount of time it takes that ball to reach the pitcher's mound to home plate. Ha anyone know how far the distance is from the mound to home plate? 60 feet, 6 inches. From the pitcher's mound to home base. Now, everyone, real quick, blink. All right, I'm asking you to close your eyes in the sermon. Blink. And the amount of time it takes us to blink, that's the amount of time it takes that fastball to reach the pitcher's hand to the catcher's mitt. About four, one, or 400 milliseconds. So four-tenths of a second is the amount of time it takes that ball to hit. And if you break it down... It takes about 100 to 150 milliseconds for the eye to even acknowledge an image, to start processing an image. So of that 400 milliseconds, 150 of it are gone just from that batter trying to identify where that ball is. And then there's another 25 milliseconds where it takes for him to tell the signal to his arms to swing. And so we're eating up this, this big section of time. It takes 150 milliseconds for that bat to come around. All of a sudden, we're at the point where he has 75 milliseconds to figure out if it's a good pitch or not a good pitch. Uh, it, at the end of this, this study, this Yale physicist determined that it is impossible for a fastball to be hit. 
from the amount of time it takes to find the ball, from the amount of time that it takes to identify that, yes, this is a pitch I want to hit, and also to swing that bat. And also the margin of error is seven milliseconds. Is the margin of error for a fastball to be hit, for it to go foul, or for it to go fair. And to his conclusion, it takes 450 milliseconds for all this processing to happen. And you only have 400 milliseconds for it to happen. It's impossible for a 90 mile an hour fastball to be hit. Does everyone agree with that statement? No, why do you not agree with that statement? Because you've seen it, right? You've seen it happen. It's undeniable that a fastball has been hit. Not only a 90 mile an hour fastball, but a 95, 96, 97 mile an hour fastball. Fast, the fastest fastball that ever has been hit was 103 miles an hour. That one just happened to go over the back fence. Um, 103 miles an hour. But this Yale physicist said it's impossible for that to happen. But we all know we don't want to accept the fact that it is impossible. Just because we can't explain it, it may be unexplainable, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that it is undeniable. And if you're with me today, let's look at this a little bit further and apply it to our lives in John chapter 9. The undeniable, excuse me, may begin as unexplainable. In John, in John chapter 9, we've just finished up in chapter 7 and chapter 8, where, where, where there's been this big debate on who Jesus is, what Jesus is. Everyone's throwing out their different opinions on who he is, who he is not, and, and how, he's, how he's around and where he came from. And we see it in verse 1, uh, it reads, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So right there we see that they're asking the wrong questions. Jesus' disciple is asking the wrong questions. I think sometimes that we, in our life, ask the wrong questions. Uh, and we completely miss the picture. When we get to heaven and we can finally ask God, what is the right answer? Is it Republican or Democrat? He's going to look at us like, what are you talking about? Hey, you completely miss the picture. The answer is libertarian, for those of you who don't know. Um, <laughs> But he's saying that what happened? Did this man sin or his parents sin? And they completely missed the picture. They couldn't explain it, but it was undeniable. Jesus' answer in verse 3. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Oftentimes we're trying to explain what's happening in our lives. And there could just be simply that it's only there for the works of God to be seen. This man was not blind because he sinned. was not blind because his parents sinned. He was merely blind so that the works of God could be seen. Jesus continues in verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Throughout John's gospel, Jesus refers to himself as being sent by God uh, on multiple occasions. Six or seven occasions so this, thus far, building up to chapter 9. Jesus refers to himself as the one that is sent by God. And it's interesting here. What Jesus does. And this the, the side note, it's probably one of the funniest stories in the entire gospel. One of the funniest stories. Because he's, he's making this point that this man was blind so that the works of Jesus could be seen. And then what does he do? He does what every good baseball, baseball player does and he spits on the ground, right? My mom used to yell at me for this. And sometimes you wonder if Mary did a good job in raising Jesus. But here you see this was one of the things that she probably could have done a little bit better job with. He spits on the ground. We see having said these things... He spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. So he went and washed and came back seen. It's pretty cool here. Just one little play on words that John is talking about. What pool was he told to go wash in? The pool of Siloam. And what does that pool mean? Sent. And who was the one that was sent? Jesus. We saw it in verse 4 and we see it throughout John's gospel. He's saying, go wash in Jesus, go wash in sin to be seen. We'll come back to that before we're all said and done here. Verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but it's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? The first of six times we see this question asked. How were your eyes open? And what is the answer? How were his eyes open? Jesus. How were his eyes open? Jesus. But that wasn't good enough here. They're trying to explain uh, Jesus away. Oftentimes in our life, we try to explain God away. And oftentimes it's there. It's point blank. It's undeniable. Even though we can't explain it, it's undeniable. Who, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, The man called Jesus made mud anointed my eyes and said to me, go, go to Siloam and wash. 
So I went and washed and received my sight. Plain and simple. That's what happened. Was that a good enough answer? They said to him, verse 12, Where is he? He said, I don't know. I didn't see where he went. That was a little blind joke right there. Sorry. I added that part. He didn't know. He didn't know where he went. But what did he know? A man named Jesus told me, or put mud on my eyes, told me to go wash. I did, and now I see. Verse 13. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. This, this whole Jesus challenging the Sabbath, he's not necessarily challenging the Sabbath. He's challenging the, the Pharisees and their interpretation of the law and what they've done. This is the second miracle that Jesus performs on the Sabbath. The first being the man who was laying by the, the, the pool, um, lame. Uh, and this caused this big uproar. And the same happened here. It was a Sabbath day. So the Pharisees asked him again, the second time we see this question, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes. I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can the man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Whenever we're encountered by Jesus, we have to make a decision. And throughout John's Gospel, we see different signs that are made, signs that are recorded. And after each sign, we are called to a decision. Do you believe Jesus or do you not believe Jesus? That's the biggest question, the most important question. Do you believe Jesus? And here the Pharisees, they had God in a box. What was the box? Well, if this was from God, he wouldn't have done these miracles on the Sabbath. That's not who we think God is. That's not what we expect God to do. They put God in, these bo- in this box. But we see in verse, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 16 that there was a division among them. When we believe in Jesus, it causes division. It causes division. Do not be surprised when our belief in Jesus causes division. Verse 17, his answer was not good enough, so the Pharisees again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So now they're starting to challenge this. And this is the exact same conclusion, the exact same answer that the woman at the well gave. When when she was encountered by Jesus, when Jesus told her about her life, she came up with the exact same conclusion about Jesus, that he must be a prophet. When something undeniable happens in your life, there there, there is no other conclusion except that this man is from God. And and that's exactly what the blind man came here. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind uh, and had received his sight. How oftentimes do our preconceived notions blind us from facts? Blind us from the undeniable. And the Jews here, they they came up with this story that, well, this man, there's no way that he was blind. He, He wasn't blind to begin with. He was just faking it for his entire life. There's no way he was blind. Well, let's talk to mom and dad. Let's bring mom and dad in. And so they did. And uh, until they called the parents of the man, I'm in verse 18, verse 19, and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. And so they're, they're, they're kind of, you see, you'll see here as we finish out this section, his parents are, are just kind of wanting to sit on the fence and saying, hey, listen, don't, don't bring me into this. We know that, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind, but don't ask me any more questions because I don't want to take a part in it. And it's kind of sad as you see why. We'll finish out this section, verse 22, or verse, uh, he said, finishing out verse 21, ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was put out of the synagogue. It is undeniable that this man was born blind. Undeniable. But it was also unexplainable. They do not know how it happened. Was there an explanation? Yes. Jesus. But that explanation wasn't good enough for them, so they refused to even acknowledge that the event happened. It goes back to our baseball illustration. If I don't understand how a pitcher or how a batter, excuse me, can hit a 90 mile an hour fastball, I'm just going to deny the fact that it ever happens. No one can ever do it because I don't understand it. Just like believing in Jesus causes division, believing in Jesus causes consequence, or, or consequences come because of our belief in Jesus. And oftentimes our fear prevents us from accepting the truth. And we see that with his parents. Their fear prevented them from accepting the truth. In verse 24, 
They couldn't accept the undeniable, so they called the blind man in once again. For a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. Confess. Tell the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. I think that would get an objection in today. I've seen enough law and order to know that you can't lead the witness in that way. We're getting an objection from the lawyer today. We know this man's a sinner. Verse 25, he answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Plain and simple. I can't explain what happened. All I know is that something happened. I was blind, now I see. It is undeniable. I can't explain it, but it's undeniable that it happened. And they reviled him. You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. One of the most ironic statements you'll see from the Pharisees. Because if they were truly disciples of Moses, they would have come to the same conclusion that Philip came to in chapter 1, verse 45. Philip goes out and finds Nathanael, and he says that, that we have found the one who Moses was talking about. And if the Pharisees were truly students of God, they would be looking for this Messiah, and they would see the signs, the same signs that Luke um, records being accounted for. When John the Baptist's uh, disciples were going out and they went and talked to Jesus in Luke 7, 22, to ask, are you the Christ? Jesus' reply was, the blind see. They reviled him. They were focused on Moses. Verse 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. It just shows that they're not only blind to sight, but they're blind to ears because Jesus went through this whole thing in chapter 7 and chapter 8. He told them exactly where he came from. This man answered, why this, uh, why, this is an amazing thing. Do you, not, do you not know where he comes from? And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this were not from God, he could do nothing. The blind man is the only one in this whole situation that can see. He's the only one that accepts that this undeniable uh, it, it happened. Verse 34, they answered him, You were born in utter sin and you would teach us. And they cast him out. Now this is where it hits us. Because oftentimes again we saw division. We, we saw consequences. This man was cast out from his society. Even though he was a beggar on the fringes, now he was removed entirely. But Jesus, what happened here? Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him. Jesus went and sought him out. Jesus seeks out those on the outskirts. Jesus seeks out the ones that have been cast out. And he accepts the cast out. Jesus said to this man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And you kind of know that, that this man was born blind. And you even look at it today. And, and, and people who are blind, can, can, they can get around just fine. And they're actually, their other senses come up and they make up for their lack of sight. And so you can kind of just picture, and I'm reading into this, um, that this blind man probably picked up on, wait, I recognize that voice. I recognize that voice when he says, do you believe in the Son of Man, which is a reference back to Daniel, and how Daniel describes uh, the Son of Man in a prophecy, that the Son of Man will come uh, and be given dominion and glory and a kingdom and served by all peoples, nations, languages, everlasting dominion, and a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And he answered, the blind man answered Jesus, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. The blind man's response, he accepts the undeniable. He said, Lord, I believed, and it prompted him to worship him. He worshiped him. When we accept the undeniable in our life, it prompts us to worship. It's the same with this blind man. When he accepted the undeniable, though it is unexplainable, it prompted him to worship. Jesus finished out and starts applying the spiritual meaning uh, in verse 39. He says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. We need to accept the undeniable over the unexplainable. Some of the Pharisees uh, near him heard these things and said, Are we also blind? The Pharisees put God in a box. They continued to put God in a box. And they refused to accept even Jesus' sight here because God was in a box to them. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. They saw the signs. They saw that this man had been blind, that this man now saw. And they refused to believe it. Refused to believe it. Christ's work in our lives is often undeniable. 
But just because we may not have an explanation for it doesn't mean that there's not an explanation. Even though we may not understand how, a, how a, a, a batter can hit a fastball doesn't mean that it can't happen. It is explainable. It just not, might not be explainable to us. I can't stand here and tell you how this microphone works. I can't tell you how my car works. We've got a rental car uh, and you, you, the, it knows when the keys are inside the car and you push a button to start. If the keys are outside the car, you push the button, it, 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 it won't start. I don't know how. Um, I guess it's a good way to make sure the keys are with you. Uh, but the same with, we got here on a plane. I have never seen someone say, I'm going to refuse to get on that airplane until I firmly, expl or until you can explain to me to where I can understand how that plane works. If I remember back to high school physics, I know it has something to do with this guy Bernoulli uh, and a Venturi effect, but, but I have no idea how it works. But it's undeniable that it does work. And, and, and we'll see that throughout our lives with Christ. It's undeniable that Christ changes our life. It's undeniable that our lives fall apart when we remove Christ from our life. I can't explain how, but after time, the, those questions get smaller and smaller and smaller. You, you get an understanding even if you don't get an explanation. And the same with an airplane, the same with a, a pitcher and a batter, that while I may not understand it, while I may not be able to explain it, doesn't mean it's unexplainable to someone who's a lot smarter than me. It's undeniable that we have a hole in our heart. It's undeniable that the hole can only be filled with Jesus. It's undeniable that we will remain blind if we do not wash in Jesus. It's undeniable that no matter how hard you try, money, possessions, work, hobbies, people, family, friends, children, will not fill that Jesus-sized hole that's in our hearts. It's undeniable. And it's on that note that I'd like to finish up today. Look at your life. Look at, at what you've done. And what did this blind man do? When he was confronted, when he had an opportunity to, to, to tell someone, what did he say? Did he go into the nuts and bolts? Did he have the answer to every single question as to how Jesus changed his life? How Jesus healed him? No, he just said plain and simple. He told me, he put mud on my eyes, he told me to wash, and now I see it's the same in our life. We may not have all the answers, but that should not stop us from saying that Jesus is the reason why I live the life, of, the, the life I live. Jesus is the reason that I have peace. Jesus is the reason that I'm content. Jesus is the reason that I'm happy no matter what happens. Jesus is the reason. And it's undeniable that this Jesus, as Paul reports in Philippians 2, even though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, we should do just what the blind man did. Every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. It is our custom and it is our tradition that if there is something that, that you need some help with, if, if there uh, is some blindness in your life that Jesus can help you see, if there are, are, are struggles that you have, if there's anything that you need from the church, ask. Don't wait for Dortha McCollum to hit you upside with the head with a two by four. But if you need a two by four, you could probably find some. It's undeniable that Jesus is in our lives. It's undeniable in my life because of you guys. And I appreciate Loveland for that. I thank you for your time. And if there is a need, please, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing together.